If you've been following along in this series, then you know the goal is to figure out how to make $10,000 a month through short-term rentals. <sighs> I'm sorry, man, I'm tired. I'm tired. <laughs> If you've been following along, then you know the goal of this series is to teach you how to make $10,000 a month with Airbnb. Last week's video gave you the blueprint on exactly how I would do this if I lost everything today. And today we're gonna talk about the two business models within OPP that you can use to scale very quickly. Number one being rental arbitrage and number two being co-hosting. By the way, this video is the second in my three-part series on how to start an Airbnb business with zero dollars. So you're gonna wanna hit the subscribe button and notification bell so you're notified about the last video in this series coming out next week. Now, if you are a follower of the channel, you know that I have not said nice things about rental arbitrage. And I just wanna take a quick moment to say that I'm sorry. I understand that rental arbitrage is the only way that some of you can afford to break into the short-term rental game, which is why I've actually added a couple arbitrage units to my portfolio to learn the system so I can teach you the methods the way that I do them so that you can scale accordingly. And I do wanna just say that rental arbitrage is not my favorite way to break into Airbnb, but it is an accessible way. And my goal is always to teach you how to build wealth, not cash flow. But if you follow the principles that I'm gonna teach you today, you can build cash flow, save it up, use that to buy property and build wealth. Okay, this is the only thing I'm asking from you is if I teach you how to do this, do not get tempted by the $10,000 a month and retiring on the beach mindset, I freaking hate that. What I want you to do is stack that money away and use it to buy properties. Cool, deal, are we good? Let's do this. By the way, if you stick around until the very end of the video, I will not only teach you how to get into your first unit, but I will also run you through the numbers and profits of these business models. And as a friendly reminder, I do have this blueprint right here that I've developed specifically so that you can follow along and implement this in your own business. Let's get down to brass tax here, which is by the way, brass, T-A-C, KS, not T-A-X. I always thought it was like a tax on the metal brass, but it's just like tax, like a like a wall tax. Eh, it doesn't matter. Let's talk about what rental arbitrage is and what co-hosting is and really just define what the difference is between the two. Rental arbitrage is the business model within short-term rentals where you go and you pitch a landlord on renting their apartment and then locking up that contract, furnishing said apartment, and then relisting it on websites like Airbnb and Verbo.com. So the basic premise here is if you go and you rent an apartment for let's say $900 a month, that comes out to $30 a day that you are paying in rent to that landlord, right? The idea is that you then furnish it, list it on Airbnb, and charge more every single night than your expenses to run that property. And that's the basic premise. You rent a place for a set cost, you rent it for more than that cost on Airbnb, you make the profit in between. We'll break the pros and cons down of this business model in just a second, but first let's get into what co-hosting is. Co-hosting is also a very simple premise here and that you go and you run someone else's property and you manage it for them and you charge a management fee. So you go and you find a landlord or someone who owns a second home that they're not doing anything with. And you say, hey, you guys list this on Airbnb. I will run all the day-to-day -day operations. I'll run all the messages. I'll do all the pricing. I'll coordinate with all the cleaners. And in return, I will charge you anywhere from 15 to 30% of the gross revenue. So if you go and you find someone who has a furnished property and you say, hey, I'm gonna co-host it for you. And then you list it on Airbnb and then they make $1,000 that month and you charge a 20% management fee. Then guess what? You just made 200 bucks managing that property. Wait, hold on really fast. If you like what you're hearing and the idea of starting from nothing and building a sustainable short-term rental business excites you, or you're just looking to scale your Airbnb business with other people's money and partnerships, then you need to register down below for my biggest workshop of the year. It's live, thousands of people show up, and I've specifically put together a workshop that I've never done before that will walk you through the steps that I took to build a $12 million real estate portfolio. It's 100% free. I'm gonna leave a link down below. It is first come, first serve, so be sure to register and get there on time because every year I get people that were mad that they didn't get let into the Zoom because it maxed out. Okay, and one more thing, I will be making a huge announcement at this workshop that I promise you, you will not wanna miss. Okay, all right, that's all I'm gonna say, but I will see you at by far my largest live workshop of the year. Now back to the video. Now that you know what these two business models are, let's talk about the pros and cons associated with each one. Now to just put this out there, I got started in the rental arbitrage space whenever I got into Airbnb, okay? So I do understand the landscape and I actually have four rental arbitrage units at the moment and we're also working on a few more too. So the pros of rental arbitrage, it is a lower cost of entry into the Airbnb game versus buying a house. Most rental arbitrage units you can get into for anywhere from like 8,000 bucks to $20,000, right? It's a pretty big range there. Whereas if you were to go and buy a house, let's say it's 
it's a you know three hundred thousand dollar house you had to put twenty percent down that would come out to sixty thousand dollars on the down payment maybe another five thousand dollars for closing costs maybe another twenty thousand dollars for furniture that puts you at eighty five thousand dollars whereas on the rental arbitrage side it's much less so you can see why this appeals to people that really have low to no money to get started the other nice thing about this model is that it allows you to build cash flow relatively quickly if you can launch an arbitrage unit you can pretty quickly start making anywhere from eight hundred to two thousand dollars a month per unit most of the time the average is closer to a thousand to fifteen hundred bucks per month that's so amazing right because if you can do that several times it starts stacking up very fast and because of that it actually allows you to scale faster not only are you building cash flow very quickly if you can save that you can use that money to get into another rental arbitrage unit whereas if you go and you buy a house and let's say all you had was eighty five thousand dollars you go you buy that three hundred thousand dollar house that i cited earlier and then you're pretty much out of money that house will cash flow but it's going to take you a very long time to save up eighty five thousand dollars again unless you just like i don't know have a trust fund or something just like me just kidding <laughs> it's always funny so many people are always like oh this trust fund baby giving advice and blah blah i'm like eh, my parents were immigrants so you know i really did start from zero okay so remember when i say this stuff it comes from a place from someone that's done this before Okay. The other pro of rental arbitrage is that it is less risky than buying a house in some capacities. This one's a little bit more on the debatable side, but let me walk you through what I mean here. If you get into a rental arbitrage unit, and let's say you're all in 15,000 bucks and you underperform on that unit, well, you don't have to renew that lease, right? You can always just walk away and then you can sell your furniture and you might take a small loss, but at the end of the day, you are probably going to be out no more than that $15,000 that you invested. On the flip side, when you go and you buy a house, let's say it's a half a million dollar house or a million dollar house, if it doesn't work out, a lot more is at stake because a lot more money is in that deal. Please keep in mind that I'm not saying, hey, don't go buy a house. That's not what the video is about. I, it would be my preference that you go buy a house for many reasons, but this is, again, a rental arbitrage co-hosting shootout, okay? So the last pro here that I see in the rental arbitrage side of things is that there's really very little maintenance, much smaller utility bills as well. Um, most of the time, a rental arbitrage unit is going to be like an apartment or a townhome, and because of that, oftentimes, the building is in charge of the maintenance or the landscaping. Now, of course, this does change if you rental arbitrage a house which is totally possible then you are on the hook for those expenses and for the landscaping and all that type of stuff but in general like i said it is most of the time like apartment condos that type of thing and so your bills are going to be lower because the spaces are typically smaller and the maintenance most of the time is not on you because you don't own that property it is not your responsibility it is the responsibility of the owner of that property aka the landlord all right the cons here's what i don't like about rental arbitrage please take please Oh, I've done this so many times. Please pay special attention to what I'm about to tell you, all right? The biggest con by far is pitching landlords, all right? It's not that easy to pitch a landlord. It's gonna take you many, many phone calls. It typically is gonna, when you're starting out, gonna cost you, what am I saying? Oh, that's right. It's gonna take you about 100 phone calls to get a landlord to say, yeah, sure, I'll let you do this, right? Because oftentimes, landlords are not down for this concept. They see Airbnb as super risky. They would rather have the stability. They would rather have regular long-term tenants that they don't have to worry about versus like some person saying like, hey, let me rent your place on Airbnb. I'm gonna throw parties here every day and there will be drugs everywhere. Like that's what landlords typically think about Airbnb. So you have to talk them down the ledge and convince them that you are a great operator and it's just not as easy as people make it seem sometimes. Although it is totally doable, it just requires work, right? One of my students in host camp, Eric, he's got 36 units and he's dialed in his pitch very well. He says at this point, it takes him between 30 and 50 calls to lock down a landlord. But the point is that there's still some work to be done when you're pitching a landlord. Second thing, you you get zero equity, right? You are paying rent to someone else. That rent disappears. All the money, if you lock down a two or a three or four year lease, you pay a landlord $100,000, guess how much of that you get to keep? Zero, nothing. You have paid down their principal balance. It's not necessarily a bad thing because you'll make profit on those units. It just means that the landlords are the ones that get all the upside. And that is the key difference between owning a property and rental arbitrage is when you own the property, you get the upside in the tax benefits, whereas another con for rental arbitrage is you do get some tax benefits like write-offs on furniture, and ordinary business expenses, but you don't get those sweet, sweet, sweet tax benefits that you would get if you actually owned a property. For example, the short-term rental loophole, which enabled you to take massive bonus depreciation and massive losses that you can apply towards your W-2 income, and it can really just supercharge your ROI on a specific property. You don't really get that kind of stuff with rental arbitrage, right? Other big con for rental arbitrage is that it is a temporary business, okay? So it just means that when your lease is over in 12 months, so is your business, unless you've convinced your landlord to let you extend. You're building good cash 
cash flow, but you can't count on that cash flow to stick around forever. And last big con here, I don't think you have as many exit strategies than when you own a property, for example. Like if uh, you get regulated, for example, your only real option is to convert it to a midterm rental or in that lease. Whereas if you own the property, you could convert it into a long-term rental, a midterm rental, you could flip it, you could sell it. And if you built equity over the years, you could actually come out with a profit. I think you just have more options when you own, but this is just something to keep in mind with rental arbitrages. High cash flow, which is great, but no upside, no tax benefits, temporary business model. All right, now let's get into co-hosting. What are the pros here? Well, the big pro of co-hosting is that it pretty much takes you zero dollars to start. Rental arbitrage, you are on the hook for all the furnishing expenses, and you're also on the hook for the monthly rent, by the way. But when you're co-hosting, the vast majority of the time, the owner of that property is on the hook for the cost of the furnishings. They're also on the hook for the monthly mortgage, the expenses, the landscaping. You are just managing it no matter what. At the end of the month, you get your 20% or your 25% or your 50, whatever management fee you negotiated, 20%. You get your 20% cut no matter what in most standard agreements. But this is, I mean, I just really want to emphasize that these are huge pros to co-hosting is that regardless of performance, you get paid. And we're going to get into why that's also a con, but you're not really going to lose money as a co-host. Whereas on rental arbitrage, if you underperform and you didn't make enough money to cover your rent, guess what? You got to pay out of pocket for that. And so because of this, I actually think that co-hosting allows you to scale so much faster than any other business model in the Airbnb space. What I also really love about this one too is that it is regulation resistant in that if you get regulated or pushed out of the market because of laws or anything, it's not your property. You're not in a 12 or a 24 or a 36 month lease. You can end that agreement literally anytime. And honestly, I kind of just feel like at the end of the day, your profit on these properties are pretty much what you're gonna make from rental arbitrage for the most part. I mean, rental arbitrage, like I said, we're trying to make like a thousand to 1500 bucks a month and you carry all the risk in that business model. Whereas if you're co-hosting a property that let's say makes $50,000 a year and you take 20% of that, that's 10K. 10K divided by 12 is like, what, 800 bucks a month? Let me see. Uh. $10,000 divided by 12. Yeah, 833 bucks a month. It's a little less, but you literally bear 0% of the risk. Cons of co-hosting, it's a temporary business, just like rental arbitrage. You don't own the unit. And remember I said you get paid no matter what, even if you underperform? Well, guess what? If you underperform, you can get cut out of that, right? You, they can just fire you and they can find another co-host to manage their property. So you are incentivized to perform. Again, you build no equity and there are no real estate tax benefits to this model. But for the most part, I think <laughs> as... <laughs> <laughs> what just happened? But for the most part, <laughs> But for the most part, uh, after kind of going through all the pros, I'm just like, why wouldn't someone co-host over rental arbitrage? I mean, you could theoretically make a little bit more money rental arbitraging, but considering the whole no risk thing with co-hosting, I just, I'm a big believer in that business model. We co-host a couple units now. I like the fact that no matter what, I will never lose money on those properties because I can't. It's literally not possible due to how we've structured the agreement. Okay, so I said at the beginning of this, I would tell you how to get your first leads for both of these models and they're gonna be a little bit similar. But for those of you that are like, all right, I like this. I, I don't have a ton of money, Rob. I do want to break into this. Show me. How do I actually get my first lead? Well, most of the time in the arbitrage space, it's actually a little bit more simple than you think. You are hitting up websites like Redfin, Trulia, Zillow. You are going to the for rent section and you are literally calling landlords and you are pitching them on the concept of rental arbitrage. Now, there are more sophisticated ways of doing this. You can hire VAs to scour the internet, text blast thousands of landlords across the country, see who is interested, send them to you. You can then find out which landlords were the most interested and then reach out personally and close them that way. But most of the time you're just making those phone calls straight off of like Redfin or Zillow. I also really love real estate meetups. I think this is such a strong place to get rental arbitrage leads because if you think about it, real estate meetup is a bunch of investors that are all hanging out. And if you go and you ask people like, what do you do? I do long-term rentals. I do multifamily. And they say, what do you do? You can say, oh, actually I'm an Airbnb host. Would you consider allowing me to arbitrage your property or co-host your property? And the reason this is so big is because when you are calling a landlord on Redfin, for example, their guard is up. They think you're a spammer, they think you're a scammer, right? And so you have to work really hard to wine and dine them and romance them on the idea of rental arbitrage or even co-hosting. Whereas at a, at a meetup, oftentimes you, you might be at a bar or a brewery drinking beers, hanging out, building a rapport with people. And so when you offer the idea of rental arbitraging or co-hosting someone's property, they're way more open to it way more open to it. So this is a magical way to get the best leads in rental arbitrage and co-hosting. Like there, this is my favorite way. After you've actually built a business doing rental arbitrage, if you're super crushing it and you have a great relationship with your landlord and you pay them on time, guess what? The next best way to get leads is other landlords. Word of mouth travels very fast. If I'm a landlord that has an amazing rental arbitrage tenant and I'm making more than market rent, for example, what am I gonna do? I'm gonna go tell all my other landlord friends, hey, guess what? This guy, Rob, he pays me a little bit more than market rent, 
pays me on time, he's been an amazing tenant, and then they're all gonna say, would you do that for me? Yeah, I think he would. And then you can get connected that way. Co-hosting is an interesting one because I think it is a lot of the same methods, real estate meetups, Redfin, Zillow, but the two big lead sources that I think you can dive into are Facebook groups. You can go to so many groups within the Facebook community, garage sale groups, real estate investor groups. Like you can get very creative with this and you can just post what you do and say, hey, I'm looking to rent someone's property for two to four years so I can rent it on arbitrage. Or, hey, are you a landlord that wants to make more money every single month? I'll co-host it for you and I'll t charge a fee and you'll more than likely make more than you would with a long-term rental tenant. I know that sounds crazy, but when you tell a real estate investor that they can possibly make more money than they're already making, guess what? They're probably gonna say, huh, sounds good. Let's try that thing. Hello, hello, hello. All right, just making sure the mic was on. Woo, man, that would be real bad if it was off. Last big one, social media. Post about your journey. Tell people what you're doing. Go out there, make posts about your Airbnb portfolio, document your journey in excruciating detail and make it known that you are a co-host or a rental arbitrage operator and I promise you the leads will come. If you tell people, hey, I manage properties. Do you have an extra condo? Do you have a second home that's collecting dust that you're paying the bills on? Hit me up, shoot me a DM. I can manage that for you and I can at least help you make money on that whenever it's sitting vacant. And you'd be very surprised at the amount of leads that hit you up. I know plenty of people that do this. I know plenty of people that aren't influencers that have built six-figure business doing this exact thing, posting about their journey on TikTok and Instagram Reels. You may remember Mercedes Sanchez. Insert clip here of my interview with her. She has built the majority of her co-hosting business through social media, so I promise you, this works. Final piece of this whole pie here, the numbers. What does it cost to get into this? How much can you make? All that good stuff, right? So co-hosting for the most part, zero dollars. There might be some other expenses that you'll have, you know, like tech softwares and all that stuff, property management systems, dynamic pricing, that you're very, relatively minimal. And again, most of the time, the landlord themselves are gonna pay for that out of their expenses. So all in all, I would say there aren't a ton of expenses here. Your real expenses are gonna come if you're executing a rental arbitrage unit. Stop, Caleb, don't leave that in there. My nose itched, I'm a human. Let's move on. I always budget about $10 a square foot, but I would say these days, I'm really spending between 15 to $20 a square foot. And so for a thousand square foot apartment, you can usually count on spending between 10 to $15,000. Now that can be a lot cheaper if you get thrifty and all that kind of stuff. But for the most part, the expenses of a rental arbitrage unit are first month's rent, last month's rent, furniture. So if you're renting a place that's 1200 bucks a month, you're gonna have to pay $2,400 in first and last month's rent, your deposit, right? And then let's say $10,000 to $15,000 in furniture, you are looking at roughly anywhere from twelve dollars to $17,000 to start. Now, it can be a lot cheaper than that because sometimes you can negotiate free rent. Sometimes you can work it out with the landlord to give you 13 months for the price of 12. There's a lot of tricks to the trade here, but I would say on average, ten to 15,000 is what I'm seeing. Now, with that said, I actually have a higher end rental arbitrage unit and uh, we spent about $20,000 on furniture. Show the photo here, Caleb. And our rent is $3,300 a month. So we have to pay the $3,300 a month and then the last month's rent. So $6,600 plus $20,000 all in, we're looking at $26,000 for a high-end rental arbitrage unit. And on average, that unit brings in about $1,500 a month. But if you look at this, this month right here specifically, uh, you can see it's $7,032 if I remember that correctly. This was a midterm rental. This was a month long booking. I love it. It's a juicy one. After our rent of 3,300 bucks, expenses are usually about $600 in utilities and then one cleaning fee of 275. We made 2,800 bucks, I think. I just guess. I'm pretty sure it's 28. I, I've ran these numbers. So 732 minus 3300 minus 600 minus 275, 500, 600 minutes, 2857. Boom, baby. That one unit is gonna make $2,800 in one month. And obviously we're not always gonna make 2,800 bucks. I told you my rolling average is about 1,500 bucks, but sometimes it's much higher, 2,800 bucks. We're not gonna hit that every month, but it's really freaking nice when we do. Okay, to be fair, I would never make 2,800 bucks co-hosting the same unit, right? So there are some upsides to rental arbitrage if high cash flow is the goal. All right, final reminder here to click the link down below to register for my largest live workshop of the year. I got a crazy huge announcement and thing that I'm gonna be dropping and I'm gonna be talking through a lot of the stuff that we've talked about here and how you can apply it so that you can build a multi-million dollar real estate portfolio. All right, that's it. Click the link down below before it fills up because it always does. Now back to the video.
All right, and that is the basic premise of rental arbitrage and co-hosting. And if you're like, dude, I wanna get into this. I've got the money to do it. Great, fantastic. But if you're like, hey Rob, I wanna do this, but I don't have the money to do this, then you're definitely gonna wanna watch my next video, I promise, where I am gonna teach you how to scale your Airbnb portfolio using OPM, AKA, other people's money. I'm gonna show you my blueprint of how I built a $10 million plus portfolio using so many other people's money, and most of the time, not my own. So if you wanna watch that video, hit the subscribe button and the little notification bell so that you're alerted when it comes out. And you can also click right here. It'll be right here once it's live. But if you're watching this a few days later, it should be. Bye.